All right, Ken Jordan, it is all yours today. What are you going to talk about? Uh, the reasons our customers got hacked in 2022. Not just our customers, but that's kind of how we took this. Um, so, you know, this started as the top some number because we didn't really know how far we'd get in this process. We ended up at 10, so that's good. Yeah, we did. That was uh, a, a little surprising as well. But there's a common theme across cves across industry investigations across all these corporate entities who do studies of hacks they all come down to a a pretty common number i do feel like we did this webcast a year or two ago and uh something similar yeah yeah. but the answers should not shock you (laughs) they shouldn't they might so you want to start us off? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. A little intro. Do we do we say something? Jason, correct us if I'm wrong. But hello, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us, taking the time to hang out with us. We've got a lot of good and interesting data from our sets, from research, just to share with you about what happened this last year in the news, what happened with our contracts, what happened with our interns, and the work we've done. And and we want to share all that with you. So thank you for being here. It's interesting, Jordan. Uh, smart install, more like smart intrusion, Jordan Drysdale. Uh, and I am Ken Teichler. Uh My passion is designing PowerPoint slides. I spent yes. at least an hour uh, on design with this. this and doing it with the solutions Microsoft has provided us for yes. graphics and art. And uh, yes, no, no G there's... slides here. We're using actual PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, we think we're pretty decent people. So if you don't believe us, just ask us and we'll we'll tell you that. That's fair. I appreciate that. (laughs) We have integrity. So So, this is a slide we learned from John, I don't know, about five years ago, maybe seven when we did that first webcast. And he said, you know, the webcast was great, but you missed something. Ken, what was the executive problem statement in that first slide deck? Was it uh, Wi-Fi hacking or how to to Wi-Fi hack better? I can't even remember. But we We didn't have one. No, we didn't have one. We learned that we always need an executive problem statement uh, when we talk about things like this and we really need to define out what we're trying to solve when we do these webcasts otherwise we're just we're just all over the place and we just kind of meander about because we have adhd right so our executive problem statement here or by the way this is the eps so you do uh anyways so we we want to help you understand why everyone keeps getting popped and when we work with customers they seem to already know that it's just a matter of time and our customers can really gain a lot by understanding what else is going on in the industry and in different verticals and kind of seeing the patterns that are happening. And if we do some analysis on that, we can kind of try to drive and focus on some certain areas that that need some improvement. And that's what we did here. We really tried to figure out what areas this year we saw needed the most improvement. This year, uh, looking back at all of our engagements, what led to us being able to compromise one of our customers' environments and uh, what was the most effective tools for us and that type of thing. So that's our EPS. That's our executive problem statement is just trying to help customers uh, understand and better utilize their time going forward uh, to try to prevent hacks, essentially. So we ask this question a lot and our customers ask this same question a lot. Are our tools working and is there something I can buy to fix like my peers in industry getting hacked and can i not get hacked with dollar bills can i spend my way out of this problem sometimes i mean it's all about money at the end of the day so yeah sometimes definitely but remember i always say easy buttons you have to put ftes on there's no easy button that doesn't have an fte yeah which ftes manage which tools and a lot of tools these days as you say need an fte Mm -hmm. so we looked back uh looking at cves from 2020 the top exploited cves uh cves are common vulnerabilities and exposures uh so we went back and looked for t- the top 20 that were exploited uh sorry the top 15 or so that were exploited in 2020 and we found some interesting patterns uh in 2020 the most common ones that were exploited were from 2019 and 2018. there were a few 2020s in there but it's kind of interesting that the most exploited are actually from years prior and we find that rather interesting because it means that as uh, a exploit comes out, it's being exploited. Typically, uh, organizations um, have 
a benefit to releasing a security patch that will prevent the exploit. And if everybody's on top of their game and running patches accordingly, the CVEs really won't turn into a problem because as soon as the CVEs come out, there's a big push to get a patch. And as soon as the patch is out, you can deploy it. And then the exploit becomes uh, not worth it. That becomes essentially, uh, that's what I'm looking for here. Uh, stopped. Mitigated. Less valuable. Less valuable. Yeah. yeah less targeted. You know, so from that perspective, we find it interesting because in 2020, we were looking back at, at exploits from 2017. And yeah, that kind of tells us that there's this pattern about that. So, yeah, I would agree with all that. I I guess I would like to add, we're we're both business majors here. So we think from the perspective of how to manage and operate a business as we investigate and analyze networks and, and things of that nature. So pardon me taking a step back here and saying, Kent, when we use business related acronyms that uh, the security industry may not be aware of, like, let's go ahead and spell those out. Like FTE to us an FTE is a full-time employee. Now you've already got a bunch of full-time employees, your IT operations team, maybe five, 10 people. You may have a security branch. So from that perspective, asking you to bring in an FTE to manage your new threat optics platform, visibility, alerting and alarming, you may not have any budget left. You may not, you, you may be in a scenario where all the plates are already full at your organization and you need to throw more on those plates. It, it's, it's just complicated out there. But I think to Ken's point, CVEs are unfortunately left in, uh, in airspace, right? What I'm trying to say is like, these should have been patched, but maybe you just weren't maintaining contracts. So a couple interesting things about CVEs. Uh, one is that we, in our industry, we kind of consider them uh, a mechanism for responsible disclosure. So we can open a CVE, request a CVE, uh, and then we essentially can use that for tracking as we disclose uh, a vulnerability to a vendor, right? And then ideally the vendor patches the vulnerability uh, before the CVE gets fully published. That's the ideal world. That's not always the case, and that's not always what happens. But sure. regardless, what we want to point out here is that uh, the CVEs are sponsored by DHS and CISA. So if you kind of look at it from the, that perspective, uh, it affects everybody, right? And this is basically a catalog of known vulnerabilities uh, for software applications, for vendors, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So then looking at 2021, we did the same thing. We looked at the top 15 or so for 2021, and we saw this same pattern where in 2021, the top exploited CVEs were mostly from 2020 and 2019. And that kind of leads us to something interesting that now we see this pattern of things essentially aren't being patched. Now, there are a couple of things that are interesting here. Uh, we see Exchange CVEs, right, from Microsoft Exchange. And as we look at 2022, there was also another Exchange uh, exploit that came out, and it was related to the one from 2021. So you kind of see these patterns over time. Uh, it's very interesting from that perspective. But when the CVEs, the ID is here, CVE dash, and then the year that the CVE was issued. So when you're working in 2021, uh, if you get a CVE, it'll be CVE dash 2021, etc. Here you see that they're again, they're older CVEs, zero login for 2020 was being exploited, one of the top exploits in 2021. So it's rather interesting. And then again, we have Pulse uh, Secure, Pulse, or sorry, uh, Pulse Secure for, as from 2019, one of the top exploited in 2021. And then the, the Fortinet, Fortinet OS uh, path reversal is an interesting one as well. So there's definitely some things that are interesting about this, just from the perspective of this is an indication that things aren't being patched. Yeah. And unfortunately, what it looks like to me is you go buy a Fortinet firewall, you drop that firewall out there you fail to maintain your service contracts with Fortinet, you don't get patching, you don't get updates, nobody really looks at that device. It's discovered on the internet open, and unfortunately is then compromised, and so are you. However, let me go ahead and say, because you didn't manage your service contracts, you probably don't have a POC assigned, you probably have no idea the compromise happened. And then a couple hundred days later, the FBI comes and knocks on the door and says, hey, your network was compromised, you gave up a bunch of credit card numbers, and they all point back here. Do you mind if we take a look around the place? It's it's an uncomfortable scenario to be in where, as pen testers, and we'll get here, we run a vulnerability scan on the inside of an environment. We see bright red on everything. You've basically failed to patch. That We see it so commonly. And unfortunately, that results in compromise. Any exposure 
results in soft and squishy, easy access to the interior of your infrastructure, lateral movement, privilege escalation. So <clears throat> it's it's too bad we still see these things. But vendors, I, I think the push to maintain service contracts is unfortunate. However, these people also have intellectual property, millions of dollars in research and development, building their OSs. So you don't just get the patches for free. You have to also maintain service contracts. So a couple of things. Uh, these uh, top 15 CVEs that come out, they're issued right around uh, March, February or March, April of the following year. So the 2022 list will come out from CISA in 2023. Uh, you can kind of expect that. So obviously we don't have that right now, but a very, very good chance that Microsoft Exchange will be on there with uh, proxy login and proxy not shell. So, uh, and also proxy shell in this case. So there'll be some interesting what coming out from there. So what we want to point out is we just talked about a bunch of CVEs, a bunch of vulnerabilities, a bunch of exploits. And now we want to transition a little bit and say, that is not uh, what we feel will be the top 10 or top number of uh, findings <laughs> that we saw this year. And yes, zero days are scary. However, uh, they might be destroying your network. However, at the end of the day, we are actually compromising networks because of deficiencies that have nothing to do with CVEs. Yeah, very rarely are those CVEs our access points or access entries into your environments. It's just, it's not how we're gaining access anymore. It's not, uh, let's, let's say you do have some exchange vulnerability. Your EDR is probably updated with the signature exploit code. So when we try to shovel that into memory, we we don't get shell back because it was detected on the fly. So a lot of these exploits, even through an authenticated, you know, mailbox session, we we aren't able to shovel exploit code the same way we used to be able to. So we just we don't exploit things the way we so an active directory environment, Sysvol, you kind of saying here, hacker finds plain text creds in Sysvol. When I say plain text creds, I don't mean a PowerShell script that submits creds when it runs. We've actually seen cases in the last year where our customers have uh, produced their own software, right? Their own agents, their own uh, applications, their own DLs, EXEs. Uh, they put them in Sysvol so they can be shared with all uh, of the, the computers in the environment and then push according with a GPO. Uh, but then when we get in that environment, we'll actually pull all those files down. We'll pull all the DLLs, all the EXEs. And if they're using .NET, that is very, very easy for us. We don't even have to decompile it because it's .NET. So we can essentially run some way like DN spy. And if you have hard-coded creds inside there, we just pull them out. Or encryption routines that describe your keys and things of that so, nature. Yeah. Just real quick, don't put passwords. Don't put hard-coded passwords inside of applications. Don't compile it. Don't use .NET and think that it's compiled. Uh, use SPNs for that. Use uh, service accounts for that. Don't put stuff inside of, of uh, software directly. Java creds, yep, absolutely. Yep. All right, hackers. That's the thing is we don't just look at exploits. Yes, that's one of the things that we do look at. It is some of the tooling that we use as those uh, available exploits that might be the result of of not having a good patch uh, patch management. But there's other ways for us to find data. There's other ways for us to pivot to compromise environments. So where do we start, Jordan? That's, I mean, that's a great question. It, it depends on the service that is brought to us, right? And we looked at four primary services during this analysis. So what we're going to be discussing here coming up really soon is our investigations of our report results. I tried to obscure a lot of the sources and so did Kent and kind of, we talk about it broadly. So let's think about it this way. If we're coming after your external network, what do we want to know? We want to know the same thing uh, uh, a targeted adversary would want to know about you. So we use OSINT. We go to LinkedIn and find all your employees. We scrape those. We try to build user lists. We try to figure out where people are logging in on your environment. And then we build password spraying modules. We've got a lot of people the organization who are highly capable developers and will build custom modules to, let's say, like Okta. I'm thinking about Rhino here. Uh, it goes username, MFA, and then password. Dude is a brilliant individual and builds up what we need to do to properly password spray that. We guess credentials, get a hold of an account, and then we try to push. Push notifications should have been banned a long time ago by Duo, by Microsoft, by everyone. So we socially engineer these fish, these push notifications. 8 a.m., great timing. Noon, you know, end of day, you just get annoyed. And sometimes we just keep sending them. 
So anyway, are those that, that's kind of where we start is building a perspective of your organizations. Are those exploit based? I don't know. Yeah, are you well, technically exploiting a person? No, that's more like it's it's kind of just social engineering in my okay. perspective. I want to know if there's a CVE for social engineering. There's in, gotta be some. Internal networks are a little different, right? Let's say you invite us into your internal network and you want that perspective. The first thing I do is definitely not a vulnerability scan. It's look for weak protocols. If you're using weak protocols, the same thing we've been doing for, I don't know, a hundred years now, Kent. We look for LMNR, we look for NBNS, and we re relay that elsewhere and we get credentials. It's it's our, our same TTPs are still winning a hundred years later. It doesn't seem like anything has really changed except ADCS and that, that whole certificate chain. We don't even really need passwords anymore. If we can talk to your ADCS, like go see Gabriel's webcast. We're going to talk about that in a minute. The first credential is the deepest, and that's all it takes these days. Nine out of 10. There is something that changed, and that's that we're a year older. Yeah, that's true. We are older, and we are more effective at demonstrating. Okay, this. okay. Why are we here today? We need to get that out. Yes, fair. Fair. Go ahead. We kind of talked about this. Uh, John asked us to do a webcast. Um, or we'd we'd be thrown uh, in the cold bin, in the naughty bin. Uh, we'd have to wear a dunce hat. So we we did everything we could to do this in a short period of time. And uh, yeah, this is this is premium PowerPoint design. <laughs> if you question that, I'm sorry. You're not in the marketeering business. Uh, I'm not available for helping you design your own PowerPoint slides. All right. So CISA releases out those CVEs every year, um, but BHS has their own data, right? So we have done a lot of engagements this year, and we don't have to go back and look at um, the reports from CISA that says which CVEs were most common. We can actually look at the findings in our reports that we've issued this year, and that kind of gives us a better picture of what's actually happening with our customers. Now, our customers uh, span all the uh, verticals, almost all the verticals you can think of. Um, you know, whether it be financial, whether it be educational, whether it be uh, municipalities, governments, et cetera, we covered them all. And, you know, we didn't break out the findings in this uh, webcast based off those verticals, but needless to say, they are pretty much across the board, very, very similar. So we want to get that out of the way. Uh, in so descending order of popularity of our of the tests that we do, we do a lot of web application tests. Uh, externals, internals, and then a sub compromise and pivots. So that's kind of where we started at. Now, BHS has a lot of other types of engagements we do as well. But we were looking at the the bulk of the type of reports we do that are most common. And that's where we started looking at for our findings. So after that, we kind of went through the process of reading reports. Now, this gets uh, overwhelming. And we, tedious. <laughs> tedious. Extremely tedious. Uh, we, we also have a script that uh, I didn't update to make this work. I told Jordan last night, I was like, hey, I should probably get the script working. Yes. And then I didn't do that. Agree. So uh, he was doing it manually in a in an Excel spreadsheet. So thanks, buddy. Yeah. Uh, we probably need an intern. It's, to it's help really us interesting data, though. It the, is. The, the data is worth mining. It is. We probably might do that next year. Yeah. yeah. We'll have a, a better perspective next year because we've you know, built the process. We understand how valuable the data is. And especially if we can obscure it from our perspective so that we can store the data. We try not to keep this data lying around. There, A lot of these are basically blueprints on hacking companies. So this is something that you know dies at the end of a timeline but we should be saving what findings were found against which yeah. you know industry vertical or horizontal Just basic metrics yeah. all right yeah. so we're going to go through these top uh some number of findings that we found in our engagements this year yeah exactly so do you have a drum for no i don't have a drummer oh not number 10. <laughs> <laughs> number 10 is firewalls i'm sorry we're gonna laugh at this because uh microsoft's this, art is great uh, it's it's just great it this works. guy's name is noah tell me the story you told me uh noah i was i was convinced that someone is going to confuse noah uh in the green shirt as me uh and you'll see why as we go through uh our our presentation here but anyways i'm getting to it here uh, i am not saying it's a firewall but it's a firewall we see this all the time this is interesting because there was a time in my life where i said disable firewalls because it makes this admin easier yeah. uh don't do that I learned I learned the, the better way. Uh, host-based firewalls are huge. You need host-based firewalls. You need firewalls enabled on the, on the workstations, on the servers. Huge, 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 right? 
you're you're talking solutions though we're still talking oh, problems yeah the, the problems. next slide yeah we got the next slide coming up where okay. we'll talk right. about how to like how we theorize you should fix these problems so we're gonna go problem potential solutions so it's like we wrote this last night all yeah. right so let's talk about the actual problem here the problem with firewalls is you don't have one or you're not using a consistent policy and this is interesting because what we'll sometimes see is that some systems will be fairly well secured and you can tell if there's a policy on there and other ones you can just walk right into right we'll see this a lot of times uh too if you have like a printer printers are notorious because they don't really have any ids ips they may have a firewall but it's usually not enabled etc so anytime you have a network device think about how you're being able to protect that and we see these types of things come up because all those protocols that are on those devices as well as the windows system may have vulnerabilities on them right so especially with like smb remote procedure calls it's not even a vulnerability it's just the protocol it's what it is you are able to remotely control a system over smb and most people don't realize that they think smb is just a file share yeah so there's things about this that come up that can be prevented with appropriate firewall management which is I mean, it's not easy, right? It could be, but it's usually not. And what we find is that organizations will do a couple different things. One, they'll try to manage in-group policies, which can be painful. Uh, and when they do, then you have to have a really, really well-organized GPO stack. And the other one thing that they'll do is they'll have a third-party software. Uh, and that has varied results as well. So well, absolutely. EDR, you're talking like EDR firewall? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of ways to do this, but ultimately what we found is that not only were we able to steal credentials on networks quite commonly those credentials then gained us access to other systems so right here you can shut down a good chunk of lateral movement by taking care of this problem that unfortunately most organizations are not taking care of at this point now do we get to talk about firewalls so, All right, let's talk about firewalls. Yeah, let's talk about fixing firewalls and what, what you should be considering for next year and kind of how to move this thing forward. I'm going to go ahead and say 75%. I think that's not a terrible number. It was more like 90% of organizations did not have host-based firewalls, server firewalls. So let's let's call it three out of four networks we tested with interesting findings did not have firewalls implemented. So unfortunately... Again, this results in easy lateral movement. And in that previous slide where we talk about things like remote registries and SMB remote procedure calls, this allows us to quickly interrogate remote systems for other interesting things going on. Come up with some solution to address this. We get tired of saying the same things. And group policies work. They do. And they're free. I they're, like I like your comment. They're well, free-ish besides free -ish. the management. Yeah, right? management and licensing, but uh, licensing is with Active Directory and the Windows the Windows license. So group policies, excellent way of doing this, right? The, the question becomes, if we're able to compromise a workstation, should we be able to SMB to the workstation that's right next door, right? Not, not a file share, not a domain controller, another workstation in the same office. Should we be able to SMB connect to that? And the answer is no. There's no practical reason that you need that. So looking at host-based firewalls, disable port 445 on workstations, right? Unless that workstation is intended to be a file share or a print server, you don't need it. So those are things that you can come up with. Uh, having a single pane of glass is really helpful here. I do have to say that. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of do a single pane of glass with, with GPOs, but it's more management. Uh, and then to audit your policies, right? Don't don't look at it from perspective of, oh, we, we deployed the group policy. It should be working fine. Actually, go audit. Run Nmap. Do a port scan, et cetera. Plus, based firewalls are huge here. Uh, now, we don't want to, to minimize the effect of device-based firewalls, right? So look at network segmentation. If your workstations are on the same subnet as your servers, that could be a problem and typically is. Use network segmentation. Once you start segmenting your network out, you're able to use device firewalls with ACLs, you're able to start using IDS and IPS a lot more effectively. And then lastly, you know, we have some systems at BHS that we use that have no inbound ports whatsoever. We use zero trust with reverse proxies, and that's how we get access to those systems. So I was absolutely going to go there. And I think a lot of people laugh at zero trust because it's so buzzwordy. Yeah. It's so marketeered. It's in magazines. People are talking about zero trust. But think about what Ken just said. Let's say BHIS runs a, a web server on the inside that individuals need to access to enter their time. 
Okay. We configure that web server to have zero exposure to the internet. However, it has a checkout, right? And that, that checkout integration engine is validated by our identity services. So we authorize ourselves through our de- identity services and gain access to something that isn't exposed to the internet. It's a, a reduction in risk in so many different ways and allows you to focus your energy on your identity management and your wrappers around you know, protecting better passwords, MFAs, getting rid of push. It's zero trust actually has great use cases in cybersecurity these days. Yeah, the, the whole the whole concept of zero trust is essentially to not trust your domain, not to trust your local environment. And that's kind of the, the key piece and that's where it gets its name from. But from that perspective, it can be very useful. Uh, it's essentially, if you look at it from perspective of um, a, a network controller, in combination with uh, identity management. So you can enforce a uh, system that's logging onto something, enforce MFA, enforce a certain credential, and then have a piece of software that checks to see if that that system has AV installed to, to make sure that system has a firewall installed all prior to access, giving access to a certain uh, service or resource. So definitely something interesting there. Yeah, I like zero trust for sure. All right, next up, number nine. Message integrity, unfortunately affected a lot of customers still. There's, I, I don't want to throw a percentage out there because we were so consistent at demonstrating risk here. It's getting I, better. I, I'm going to say some organizations are starting to roll out LDAP signing, channel binding, and SMB signing. Yeah, SMB signing should be a no-brainer at this point. Now, let's say you do move gigantic files around. You can isolate those systems accordingly so that maybe they're harder to find. Maybe they're only accessible from trusted sources. Uh, You can do other things, but signing should absolutely be on the top of your checklists to take care of. Any to pass the hash. If we get so here's the thing about SMB signing, um, which is which is interesting and why it's an issue is if we get a NTLM hash, we can essentially use that as a credential if SMB signing is not enabled. That's kind of the the in the weeds portion of it. Now it gets a lot more complicated than that. But the point is, if you have SMB signing enabled, uh, you can't do that. You can't just use a password hash as though it's an actual password. And you can't relay other people's creds. Absolutely. All right. So off by default. We're going to talk about defaults because defaults is on this list. It is. Well, I have I have lots of thoughts on defaults. But yeah, off by default. Uh, you can enable them, right? And it, it doesn't, it does require effort, but not a lot. I'm thinking group policies, right? And they are always, like every one of our, our webcasts we do, it's either going to, we're going to talk about SMB signing or we're going to talk about LMNR, right? It'll typically be one of those two different things. And it's, it's, I love this. It's rarely discussed in in-flight magazines, right? When was the last time you were in, in the airport and saw a big sign that said, enable SMB signing, right? But in reality, this is such a simple one to do, and it, it can have huge implications. Now, um, I get asked every time, the, the question that comes up by the CISO, because they're doing their job, is they'll say, well, when do we, what, if this is the default, when do we not want to use SMB signing? Um, I have always struggled with the correct answer on that, because typically there there has never been a good scenario for when you haven't needed it. Uh, and I we we found one. Uh, we were teaching a class earlier this year, and a student came up to me and said, hey, I've got a story for you, uh, and this is what happened. Essentially, they were working with a very large organization, um, and that very large organization had a very uh, a specific SAN, right? So they were d- essentially doing uh, storage over the network, and it was like 100, gig- 100 gigabit or 40 bit gigabit network, something really, really fast. Uh, and they were doing video editing on the fly across the network. And they went through a security hardening and they enabled SMB signing uh, per the the recommendation of a security vendor. And they went from like 40 gigabit sustained network operations on their SAN to like less than five. And this was a problem because they had hundreds of people trying to do renders and video editing all at the same time on that system not hundreds, but several. And obviously you're cutting your bandwidth in in an eight. And essentially what was happening is the entire system was getting bogged down CPU because every patch was essentially having to be signed by SMB. Now, um, in the case where you're doing video editing, you're, you know, over the network, you're trying to jump in between videos in a certain area and you're essentially streaming data. 
But when you use SMB, every one of those packets gets signed and it gets really costly. There's a lot of latency involved in it. That is, uh, as far as I am aware, the only scenario that you really might have a problem using SMB signing. Moving large files. And if you're doing that as part of your business, there are performance implications described in Microsoft's articles about implementing this stuff. Thus, again, moving back to trusted sources for communicating with your systems where you do not enforce you, you this. You can segment that SAN off and uh, allow it to not be SMB signed, but so, protected by segmentation. So uh, require effort to implement, but not a lot of maintenance once you have it operational. All of these things are you know, intensive configurations. You want to roll out pilot groups. You want to do your testing. You want to do your validations. But once you have this stuff operational, this has a huge implication on your overall security posture. When you don't have signing, we put you at that far side of insecure just because we consider these basics. And we have demonstrated that consistently in reporting throughout the year. We talk about defaults. Here's some more. Defaults all the time. So let's start uh, with a pivot, right? Wall bins. Essentially, binaries that are already on the system that we can use to launch code. And these typically, we see them all the time, uh, have some sort of application control. Most users do not need to use PowerShell, right? Most users do not need to use MS Build or CSC. Some services might, but as an actual user logged into a workstation, typically we don't need to. So consider using application control to deny the execution of those, right? Uh, having access to Active Directory and Azure Active, Active Directory. A couple of things about Active Directory. It's a directory service. The entire mechanism of Active Directory, its entire intent is to provide information. So you have to go through the process of hardening Active Directory to make sure that you're not giving out more information than you want to. There's an attribute in Active Directory called MSDS Machine Account Quota. And there is a typo in that. There's no dash. Ah, thank you. There's no first dash MSDS dash machine account quota. So when this is set, it essentially allows a user to create a computer object. Now in a pivot, what we'll do is we'll go and create a computer, which will essentially join to the domain, right? Go create a computer object, and then we'll use that computer object as a credential, as an account instead of the user account that we actually have. It's a very quick way for us to pivot from one place to another. And depending on what group policies look like, that new computer object will either get dropped dropped into a container that doesn't have group policies or dropped into a default container or a default OU that might have different group policies than either the workstation we're on or the user account that we have. So sometimes using this is a way that we can break out of a restriction based off group policy. And allow us to do almost everything else that a normal user object can. Interrogate SPNs and get hashes for Kerberos accounts. It allows us to communicate directly with an Active Directory environment. It allows us to avoid having to relay credentials through that net NTLM to SMB signing. So say you've implemented SMB signing, this computer object misconfiguration allowed a lot of our testers to create an object and then communicate on the domain, run Bloodhound, do all of our other standard tooling, start talking to certificate services, escalate. So some of these are very standard on by default that we disagree with. That machine uh, account quota by default is 10. So any domain user on your account can add up to 10 objects. It decrements for each object added. So eventually we'll get to zero, but it's still a bad default. I have two that I have to add here. Um, yes, uh, egress filters, right? The, the opposite side of firewalls, yes, that. Um, yes, telnet being open, we should, we should have secure ports maybe. Yeah. But uh, the couple that I want to bring up, um, one are printers. I love default printers, right? Printers with default configuration, because what will effectively happen, we see this all the time, is you'll have a multifunction device that's sitting in outside of payroll or whatever, and they've got it set up to be integrated with, with LDAP. So you go to the printer, you scan, and you can select the email address that you want to send to. Uh, typically, that's done by having the printer uh, bound to or binded to Active Directory with a user account or with a service account. Uh, if you have not gone through the process of changing the default password, the administrator password on that printer, what will happen is a penetra penetration tester will log into the printer as an administrator, go run a backup of the, of the printer configuration, and guess what's in there? One of two things will happen. Some printers use plain text credentials inside that backup. Other ones will base 64, 
And sometimes, very, very con- uh, seldom, they'll use some sort of uh, reversible encryption. When they do use reversible encryption, typically we can find out through uh, the decryption keys somewhere on the internet. So those are things to consider there. The other one is DevOps. If you have Jenkins, uh, if you have GitLab, make sure you uh, set that configuration up in such a way that you cannot create new accounts and that uh, accounts that are created are restricted from seeing things like global uh, global credentials inside of those systems. So many times we've been able to log into a Jenkins platform and be able to find the global credentials, which have a service account for domain admin, because yeah, that is the best account to use if you need access problem. to everything. You brought up Jenkins GitLab too. So if you deploy GitLab on the inside of your network, it is a by default allows any email address at your domain to register an account and see your code. So again, there's so many defaults and there were a lot in our reports. Oh, there are so many. Do, All right. do you want to talk about policies, procedures, standards, guidelines, updates, uh, oh, inventory? Baseline, education programs, resources, and, and capital expenditure? Well, yes, I do. Here's the thing. None of them mean anything if they don't actually function and have teeth to them. This is where we'd say that, you know, one of the biggest um, partners you can have in InfoSec is HR because they're the ones that can put, like, put teeth into a policy and procedure, into a standard. They're the ones that can actually make it effective and give some sort of um, consequence to not following a policy and procedure. But here's the thing. These are necessary. Whether you like it or not, you need to have a piece of paper that says what you do and how you handle certain things. Uh, If you have a standard for how you handle workstations and everyone follows that, then you are reducing your vulnerability, right? You're reducing your risk. If you have guidelines, baselines, if you have playbooks that you can run through with um, IR instances, we can run through different scenarios. Those are all excellent things to have and very important, but they're not going to function unless you do them, unless you put effort into them and put time and, and essentially capital expenditure into them. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a pen test and somebody breaking everything on your domain or environment or network or phishing your employees to demonstrate to your C-levels, to your board's that you actually need more money for cybersecurity. Now, the reason we have this under default is because you can have a policy that changes defaults, or that says we change defaults. Yeah. You can have a procedure that says how you change defaults. You can have standards that says our organization will always change defaults. You have guidelines that say how to that say uh, external systems how to do that. Baselines that already have defaults changed. Playbooks that check if defaults have been changed. Tabletop exercises if defaults have not been changed education to remind everybody to change or to learn about defaults or to learn about the <laughs> absolutely and that also resource and capital expenditure they're all related to defaults they can all be applied here and to most of these findings change so defaults. that's fair we got to keep moving we got a uh, 23 minutes, oh, 23 left to get minutes right. we got we're good we got 12 slides left Hatching. two minutes per we did say cves we did say exploits here's the thing patching we brought up how those top 15 we're using exploits that were years old, right? And we see this all the time. Patches, patch management is not going well for really anybody. The only times we see it really done well are secured, highly secured, hardened environments that are related to like PCI. That's about the only time we see this done excellent. Yeah, it's tough. This it is. is a tough game. I I do not envy being a systems administrator at this point. Especially when there's zero days that come out because you got to act on zero days. You can't let them slide. Yeah, it's tough. It's very tough. But there, there's really nothing here that's a surprise to anyone who does security audits, security analysis. It's, you know, we run a scan, it comes back bright red. It, I would say nine out of 10 internals come back with a big, giant, bright red vulnerability scan. We look at it and we try to group it all together and then go after the actually important things that we care about as pen testers, which is demonstrating risk and and moving around your domain. Most organizations really like when we demonstrate credentialed access, how we go from a Linux box with no domain context to taking over the entire domain. That a lot of organizations bite on that, but when we tell them, hey, look, we saw all these signatures on your network that matched some uh, outdated Apache server, we, we kind of get laughed out of the building on these reports because people don't want to hear that. They know and they accept it. Yeah. So it's acceptable risk. And that's unfortunate. A couple of things there. Um, the, the really the, the YOLO way of doing this is enabling, uh, enforcing and enabling Windows updates. That's the YOLO way of doing it. And 
Yeah, it's it's free-ish, right? Um, you might have some some blowback if something goes bad, but you don't want to be a Noah where you uh, where you only apply updates after a pen test as you needed to. So, yeah. all right, number six. Nope. Oh yeah, we are. Thank you. That yeah. was the solutions page. Appreciate it. Weak protocol abuse. So somebody asked in Discord for a list of weak protocols. There's this is eight of them. There's a hundred and sixty four <laughs> more at least uh there okay so i i do like the um um smart install from stuff from cisco uh it's definitely useful to be into like zero config a vpn connection but has vulnerabilities right um L- element r protocol nbns uh, mdns nbns have vulnerabilities they're they're essentially uh, name services that have vulnerabilities that can be abused wpad has vulnerabilities in the way that it functions uh sql as well so you really need to look at all of these protocols and essentially go through the process of hardening them. And it, what I like about this is that we can say like, oh, go do this, right? And we can say it in 15 seconds. Uh, the actual process of deploying these things is not trivial, and we acknowledge that. But it's something that has to be done. You you harden these protocols, and you don't have to deal with them anymore. They become a non-issue. Uh, if you're still using R in your environment, I mean, it was practical in 1995 i don't think it is anymore the cost of a dns server is not that much right <laughs> let's just spit out a whole bunch of network protocols that are vulnerable oh, by default yeah. and he's absolutely right so cdp cisco discovery protocol lldp link layer discovery protocol this is switches and routers talking to each other and then agreeing on neighbor status and who they are and what they are go ahead and communicate with that uh, VTP, virtual trunking protocol, another Cisco thing, spanning tree protocol. Kent and I talked about this the other day, and I think Serena jumped in because she had some interesting theories on that. Why not become root bridge and advertise yourself with an all zeros Mac? Because let's say there's two STP routes at zeros, right? With zero default priority, the protocol then downgrade or let's see, relies on the lowest Mac address to determine who becomes root. So you advertise yourself as an all zeros Mac. You basically destroy tree and then convergence happens and everybody goes offline. OSPF, uh, you can advertise routes and routing oh. protocols without authentication. You can authenticate that, but then I believe those credentials are still spewed in clear text. Yep. So VRP, virtual router redundancy protocol, another way to jump on a network and then pretend to be one of the default routers. Anyway, there's just, there's so many, so many. All right, solutions. Uh, Element R, well, it's a GPO. It can be that easy. Uh, NBNS, not a good policy, but it could be. You essentially have to go and change the network stack in Windows, which requires a little bit more um, effort, we'll say. You essentially create a script that runs off a good policy. No, it's great. Thank yeah. you. This looks great. No, I hear. So, yes, you can just disable Element R and NBNS um, on the workstations alone, but the better way of handling that, do those things, but also look at network segmentation. Look at inspection of your network. Look at layer two protocol filtering. Use VLANs. Um, really inspect your broadcast network. See what's going on there because Element R and BNS are broadcast. So check those broadcast and multicast. Get multi- Slightly exactly. different, but yep. they they still spew data to everyone on a VLAN. Unnecessarily so if if it's not 1995. <sighs> yeah. Uh, patch your switches and routers. We don't see it as often, but there was some Cisco vulnerabilities out last year that we still see this year. Uh, specifically with Cisco devices and Fortinet. Yeah. Uh, be careful with SQL configurations. Uh, something I really find interesting is when web servers, when we can get to web.config, everybody puts their SQL, confi- uh, SQL connection strings in web.config. And if you can read web.config over the internet, then we have your password, right? Uh, and SNMP public, I mean, we still see it everywhere. The, uh, printers. Well, we do have a question that I think yeah. is worth addressing. This is... Uh... Uh, the green shirt dude is Noah, and he's Microsoft Clipart, so we can use him under license agreements and keep ourselves out of trouble with you know public image rules and licensing. So anyway, number five, web apps. And I hate throwing web apps at number five because it is one of the most common exposures and common, like let's just call it a pop, really on the internet, right? You expose an application to the internet, it is under attack within how many seconds, Ken? Well, okay. So we know from testing in our classes, about two hours, if you open up a port on the internet, it takes about two hours before you start getting attacked. We know that for sure. So 7,200 seconds. Yeah, that's not not bad. Okay. So you expose some service to the internet within 
7,200 seconds. Those are targeted attacks, not scanning. Those yeah, are targeted yeah, attacks exactly. within two hours. Because the, the scanning is so constant that yeah. once a service is identified, it goes to that escalated crew. Hey, we've got a new service. Yeah. Cross-site scripting <laughs> is huge. SQL injection still big. big. Formjack is a, a new kind. It's not new, but it's an interesting one as well. Uh, we're still looking at se session management, uh, failure to invalidate sessions on the, day, on the, the server side. Um, things like that that can occur uh, doing input validation. You want to validate all of your inputs on the server side. Don't rely on JavaScript to do it alone, right? Don't rely on client side to do that. Uh, we're still seeing uh, issues with, with ASP.NET. It's 20 years old now, right? And a lot of you are still bolting fixes onto it. I, I was thinking about this. I wrote the application in 2008, and I had talked to uh, the manager from that organization a couple of years ago, and they said, you know, the work you did uh, back when you were here, we're still using it. And I said... Oh God! Why? <laughs> what? No, you need to stop that. I know what I know. How I wrote those, you shouldn't be using those anymore. They were badly written, right? So to Ken's point, static keys and encryption were discovered in probably ten different instances, and what that resulted in is a complete compromise of the entire integrity of an application. And what do we have to tell a customer at that point? Burn it to the ground. You don't have another choice. You have to go back to zero. And what's even scarier is some of that stuff being, uh, let's say, a fourth party application. We are hired as third parties to come in and test. We discover something that belongs to a fourth party. That fourth party, we have no contractual nature to work with. And then our third party says, you can't say a thing about anything. And unfortunately, we end up with like knowledge about zero days and applications we can't disclose. They're out there for big organizations. Too bad. All right. it employees, number four, employees. We talked about phishing, right? MFA pushes was huge. Yep. Uh, phishing still works. Uh, you know, we, we're doing less social engineering calls, but we still have customers ask for them. And when they do, we go with it. We run with them, but they're almost never fun. And, and I think, I don't know. I, I think they're not fun because I don't like being a bad guy all the time. And that is like the closest thing we get to being a bad guy is essentially lying to someone's face. <sighs> never all that much fun, but really effective and that's that's unfortunate we did a phishing test at bhis uh, a couple weeks ago and uh the results were were good but we still need to go through that process of doing it run those uh types of tabletop exercises run a legitimate phishing exercise in your own organization you need to do that you know you need to check uh create a landing page where someone can enter credentials and see what happens um make sure you talk to hr because as soon as you do this you lose non-repudiation for your users. So that can become an issue from a legal perspective. But uh, we still see seasonal year password disorder. So yes, we still see credentials, winter 2022 bang. Uh, I ran into some, I ran into some that are winter 2022 bang with an, ex, uh, with an acronym of the customer name. And and it, I get it, but you gotta get past it, right? Yeah. I, I would just like to say that I believe this should be a ratified protocol. We should We should call this out. There is a disorder. And there is an approach for penetration testers and security firms to address your network and your employees. And we have ratified it. We will always guess something like this. If we're going to pass word spray organization, we always guess season, year, exclamation. It's, it's a given. It, it should be ratified, in my opinion. Okay. So we use tools like Snaffler to go out all of your SMB shares. We go and pull all the data from them and start looking to see if we can find things that look like passwords inside those files. Snaffler can do that. Uh, we look we look for things called passwords, right? If we find a spreadsheet called passwords, guess what's probably in it? It's either honey data or it's legitimate passwords. Usually it's legitimate passwords. And then again, if you have in-house developers, make sure they're following a WASP. Make sure that they're not hard coding passwords inside of DLs, EXEs, et cetera. And then uh, sharing out local drives with personal files is interesting. I just wrote a report um, where I got to have a picture of the Christmas party from like 10 years ago inside the report because it was on a file share. I found that highly amusing and so did our customers. So be aware of that. All of those types of pictures and such have uh, exit data that can be uh, recon. Yeah. So. Optics. I like Three. this one. Let's let's talk about sliding scales. There's a few different sliding scales we use. Your risk is on a sliding scale, so somewhere between critical and it, nothing, like you're doing great. And then there's the threat optic sliding scale. I kind of like this one. This is like you're blind on one side, you're blind over here, and you're a red-tailed hawk over here. You see absolutely everything that enters, exits, and you're 
familiar with the process of triaging data to get down to what matters to you. And then there's one more sliding scale, and that's the paranoia scale from promiscuous permission to paranoid or paralyzing paranoia. Yeah. There's there's these sliding scales we live under. And in this case, unfortunately, most organizations are still not doing a great job at showing back what we do as testers. Some, right? A lot of the organizations that can afford pen test services, security services have optics. They have some optics, but think about it this way. PowerShell is so heavily instrumented, every EDR product on the planet can now tell you back what happens in PowerShell. But what about Cobalt Strike? Something I learned on this recent test, uh, the Microsoft Store has an additional version of PowerShell. It runs as pwsh.exe, but is not hooked by MC. So, Maybe I might just start using that now. I, I'd never seen it before, and I'm blown away. I was under lockdown. I couldn't use PowerShell, but the Microsoft Store provided me another platform. And what about Cobalt Strike? So we get access to a beacon on an endpoint. Again, it's an informational finding for us because it's so common. We then have access to full tooling, and it doesn't matter if Rubius gets caught by your EDR on disk. We can run it through our beacon. It, it's just crazy okay. out there. So we got through this whole slide without using the acronyms MSP <laughs> um, or SOC, but I want to point out something. Um, yeah. Whether or not you have your SOC internal, you do it in your organization entirely, whether or not it's outsourced with an MSSP, whether or not you use an MSP, um, we want you to ask the question, who watches the watchers? Um, BHS does have a managed SOC service. Uh, and with that, there is a party that that monitors all of the logging, right? And then we have another team that does pen tests. And it is a red versus blue in that scenario. And we do that because we want high fidelity. We want to make sure that activities that are in a pen test, that are adversarial simulation, are seen by the watchers, right? Are being seen by our service. If you have an MSSP, if you have an MSP, if you have a SOC, right, you should be doing these things. You should be testing to make sure that they are catching things. Absolutely. Uh, breaches were very expensive. They always are. Always are. Number two, ADCS. We have moved this to front of queue. It's where we start. It's unfortunately, I, I'm going to go to 90% on this one. 90% of organizations where we used ADCS, where we investigated ACS, resulted in complete and utter compromise. Now, we start with a credential, we have a single cred, whether it's a computer object we created, whether it's the assumed compromise user you provided us, or whether it's one we earned through uh, weak protocol abuse or some other, we start with a cred. And in our ADCS investigations, 90% of the time are escalated to complete and utter chaos active directory certificate services so uh, essentially the, the the source story and this is active directory uh, certificate services in a default configuration can depending on your templates used allow you to create a credential a certificate credential for a user right not just your user but other users and obviously you can see how that can escalate very very quickly we're seeing this all over the place if you deploy adcs you have to go through the process of hardening uh this was a i don't know if it was a cve but it was an, an exploit that came out a misconfiguration detection that came out this year uh, and then quickly became uh, exploited into a scenario where you can biff it very quickly. Yeah, it's this is a terrifying toolkit. If you haven't if you haven't looked at your ADCS, assume it's vulnerable. And what I mean by vulnerable, assume your Active Directory certificate services will issue any user on your domain a highly privileged certificate on behalf of another user or alternate subject, alternate name or enrollee supplied subject being one of your DAs and it's game over. I don't need the password of that account. It's easy movement, unfortunately. So we're getting there, we're getting better. Know your tools, a couple easy tools to use. Uh, I would definitely, if you're an operations team, you've got IT, you can use PowerShell, go check, go look for vulnerable templates. If you have vulnerable templates, get them cleaned up. Yep, absolutely. Unused templates, disable them, don't have them in there. Uh, ADCS, Fletch said, should be segmented off. Absolutely. You know, you can segment it off as long as you have uh, the services that use those certificates. You can sign certificates with ADCS, so be aware that you, you might need it for revoking or to uh, to validate certs in your internal environment. So, yeah. All right. So, number one, the number one. Drum roll. Another drum roll. Any, any guesses? Anybody want to throw it out in the next five seconds? Four, three. It's credentials. <laughs> it is. It is absolutely. It always is credentials, right? Always credentials. Creds always are passwords. Creds are king. 
this is an older data set produced by uh, Brad when he was one of our interns. It actually kind of showed us how down in the weeds he can get with accomplishing missions we we give him. And this one, this was so great. Like, look at this. Yeah, you see a lot of mediums in there, but we are reporting weak password policy, whether it's on your web apps, whether it's on your externals, whether it's on your internals, whether it's on your pivots, we are reporting weak password policies all the time, all the time. I like the one that says weak password in use. So not only did you have a weak password policy, but we cracked it. And now we know that you have a weak password yeah. in use. So it's just a mess out there. It is. When we, when we tell you and we write up weak password policy, what we mean is it's time to step up your game. You're not doing it right and you're not doing it well. And that's unfortunate because if we, with our like time boxed efforts and limited, you know, limited access and limited resources, right? It's just Kent on a test or it's Kent and I, or it's Ralph and Kent. And we, there's only a couple of us and we're able to demonstrate this. Think about your adversaries with unli essentially unlimited resources can do. But we use MFA, so it doesn't matter. I love that. Yeah. Until we do an MFA push or find another bypass. Uh, things like Okta are really great because you can you can expose something on the internet and have MFA. But if you're on the internal environment, you don't have it configured for RDP. So you can just RDP around. Or SMB, use credentials on SMB and not have MFA at all. Yep. Yep. Oh. So the theory is, well, there's a lot of things you got to do to clean up. Your web apps, like a lot of customers tell us, sorry, but our customers don't want long passwords. Yep, sure, fine, whatever. Domains, like your domain passwords, Active Directory. Well, we don't have political capital left and our C suites and executives aren't interested in pushing past 10. We're good right here. Yeah. Okay, well, fine, whatever. Your source code. Uh, we got to minimum viable product. That's MVP for what we see here. I wanted to spell that out. Without security testing. Great. We what? found clear text strings, passwords, hard -coded, hard -coded initialization codes. vectors, yep. everything in code. God. <laughs> Wireless? I have asked the front desk on a wireless test for the key and been given the key. Not just to the guest network, but to the corp network. Yeah, it's just... Because they want to help, right? Oh, I don't think the guest network is working. Can you help me out? I'm here working with IT on a wireless test. Can you give me the key? Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. File shares are, are one that's shared. We know it. Uh, I could do a whole series of webcasts on... And Ben would like a word with you. It's so uh, common. It, it's it really so is. So common. So a couple things there. Yeah, these are all expensive to fix. We know that. We get it. Yeah. You need to have someone on your side, in the cabinet, in the board, your director of IT, director of security, whatever, that is pushing these things. If they're not pushing for these things, it's going to be tough. Yeah, you can wrap it all up into acceptable risk, but in reality, it's not because it gets really expensive when it goes poorly. Yeah, absolutely. Who would have thought number 10? Yeah. Number one is credentials. Yeah, shocker, right? So uh, I guess we could walk through these again. We don't really need to. I would say we got a couple minutes. Does anybody want to jump on and read us off some of the questions? We'll see if we can rapid fire these. We got about two and a half minutes left. I love this because I made... Every one of our top 10, I gave a like two to three word fix for. And it is that easy. It's just an easy button. Yeah, it's, it's easy. Good. It's done. Yeah, it's just pull these out. It's easy to fix this. Hire an intern and throw them at it. IPv6 uh, okay. is a weak protocol because it's often unmanaged and on by default. So we use MITM6, Machine in the Middle 6, to advertise ourselves as a router or respond to router inquiries from devices on your network. Then unfortunately, Windows systems ask or prefer DNS over IPv6, we respond and become an authentication thievery platform. Thievery. So we don't we don't like IPv6 being unmanaged. Password managers, uh, sorry, just no, uh, password managers are big. Like find one that's gonna work in your environment. Yeah. They can do, it. some password managers are very, very featured where you can get to the point that you are managing all of your service accounts in your password manager, that's huge. It enforces non-repudiation. That is awesome. Um, there are certain open source ones that have been tested. You might find them useful in your environments. Um, there are obviously um, commercial ones that are very effective as well that are full featured. Uh, the ones that come to mind are uh, CyberArk, uh, Thycotic has one. Secret Server, yep, that's a great yep. one. Yep. Absolutely. All right, we got one slide left here where we close. Okay, go ahead, Jason, what do you got? Uh, tell us about your class. Oh, the class. oh we got a class next week. It's next week. All right. So applied purple teaming. We talked one of the slides we talked about had uh, there's something on Discord funny uh, was talking about optics 
and how that can be a problem. Applied purple teaming, we take attacks and we take defenses. We mesh them together. We find detections. Build a and, methodology for yeah, we working your way backwards and forwards through the process. Absolutely. Uh, that class is next week. It's four days, four hours per day uh, coming up. It is super awesome. Probably the last time we teach it for a while because we're going to end up uh, trying some new things on. I have to do some more de dev on it. So check that out. That is next week. Uh, links are going to be somewhere in Discord and hanging out. Um, one question I want to address really quick. Someone mentioned, uh, can we have in our policies and procedures, our employee handbook, something along the lines of non-repudiation? And uh, your password policy specifically should say something along the lines of, you can't give your password out to others. And if you end up with someone else's password, you notify either HR, your supervisor, or that person to have them change it, right? So that should be in your password policy. And no, uh, having something just in your employee handbook is not sufficient. You do need to have a uh, other sorts of controls on that as well, but you do not want to break down repudiation because that can be a legal mess. All right, Ken, Jordan, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up the webcast today and we're going to stick around for five minutes or so to answer questions. Are you, do you have the time? Yeah. Good to go, sir. Absolutely. All right. All right. So thank you so much for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. If you ever need a red team thread hunt pen test, you know where to find us. And we appreciate this. Uh, please come back next week for our last webcast of 2022. And then we'll kick it off starting over again in 2023 with Joff Thayer. Uh, so if you like this today, keep coming back. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you Thanks all everybody. for your time.